but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers round him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the, th the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. We're going to pray now, so let's bow our heads. I'm going to look this you at a thief's prayer. Now, when Her Majesty the Queen opened the Elizabeth line two weeks ago, she was given her own oyster card, much to her bemusement. Now, apparently it wouldn't have got her very far with the amount that had been put on it, but it has the potential to get her anywhere within the London transport system. For those of you who are not familiar, this is nothing to do with purchasing oysters in the East End. This is a card which you can just pre-fill up uh, with money from either online or at a machine in London, and then you can just use it and tap a little machine at the station entrance if you so wish, um, and go anywhere you like on the London Underground or buses or whatever. It made me wonder, is there an equivalent that will get us to heaven? Is there a spiritual oyster card that we can top up regularly that will actually get us into God's kingdom? How do we get to heaven? Richard posed the question. How can we be sure that we've topped it up with enough godness to know for certain that we will go to heaven when we die. Now, a guy called John Newton had taken an active role in the slave trade during the 18th century. And yet something so changed his life that he became a pastor and he wrote that famous hymn, Amazing Grace in which we have the line, I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And as he lay dying, he is recorded as saying, I am still in the land of the dying. I shall be in the land of the living soon. I am still in the land of the dying. I shall be in the land of the living soon. 
How could someone who had been involved in such evil and profiting from it know that he was going to heaven, let alone have a place there? Could someone like Vladimir Putin and Wayne Cousins ever get to heaven? The guy whose prayer we are looking at this morning was a criminal. But he died knowing he was going to heaven. How? Can you turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 23? Luke chapter 23 and verse 32. Richard read to us Matthew's account of Jesus' crucifixion, and we're now going to look at part of Luke's account. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing, nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I want us to explore three questions together this morning. Firstly, what led to that thief's change of heart? Secondly, what does his prayer mean? tell us about his change of heart? And thirdly, what was Jesus' response to his change of heart? So firstly, the change of heart. Matthew, as we heard earlier in his account, tells us that the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So at around 9 a.m. that morning, Both thieves were cursing and reviling Jesus. Yet by midday, one of them was crying out to Jesus in faith. So why the sudden change? We don't know that the two thieves had ever met Jesus until they were marched out to the place of crucifixion with him. But we do know that their crime must have been pretty severe to have merited crucifixion. It was not some petty pickpocketing of a passerby. It must have been some sort of aggravated burglary, probably involving violence, that impacted the Roman state in some way. Maybe they had robbed a Roman granary to feed the poor, Robin Hood style. Maybe they stole from the wine and oil store of a wealthy Roman official. Or maybe they stole weapons from the local armory for the zealot resistance movement. 
Whatever they had done, their crime merited the foulest form of death and torture prescribed under Roman law. It is also inconceivable that they would not have heard the stories and rumors circulating about Jesus' miracles and the claims that he was the Messiah. They would have heard also how he had allowed himself to be captured without ever lifting a finger against the Roman occupiers. Now, this would have sounded contradictory. No genuine Messiah would fail to at least put up a fight. Other failed messiahs had fought wars and insurgencies. But this Jesus was a pathetic failure, worthy only of abuse. So by the time they'd witnessed him not even being man enough to carry his own crossbeam to Golgotha, their opinion of him would have been rock bottom. And possibly combined with anger and a real sense of betrayal. They understandably despised him along with the rest of the crowd, the religious leaders, and the Roman soldiers, they poured venom on Jesus and mocked him in derision. So, why did one of the thieves have a complete change of heart in less than three hours? The short answer is we don't know. But we can make an informed guess by looking at what they witnessed in those three hours. Firstly, the two thieves met Jesus close up for the first time. They were hanging side by side for three hours. Previously, they would have heard about Jesus. They might even have observed him as one of the crowds who'd flocked to see him. But this was different. Their meeting with Jesus was suddenly up close and personal. Extremely personal, if you bear in mind that the Romans crucified people naked. No loincloth as usually shown in religious paintings. He and they were totally exposed to each other. Nothing was hidden. They were close enough to hear each other's breathing and each other's final words. Now, hearing about someone and actually meeting them up close are two very different things, aren't they? Maybe you have heard much about Jesus, but have you actually met him? If you are doing or have done word one-to-one -one with someone and looked at John's gospel, you'll know that Jesus' response to those who were asking him who he was was usually, come and see. We give you that same invitation today. You can't make an informed decision about Jesus without meeting him yourself. You can meet him in the pages of the Bible. You can meet him in the lives of those who follow him today. You can meet him by asking him to reveal himself to you. And sometimes you can meet him through dreams and visions. Getting to heaven requires a personal meeting with Jesus. One in which everything about you is totally exposed to him. John's Gospel tells us that Jesus knows everything about us anyway. We need, dare I say, to come to him totally naked of all the pretense, barriers, presuppositions, and fears that hold us back. So they met Jesus up close and personal. Secondly, they observed Jesus' response to suffering. They would have noticed him refuse to take the pain-numbing wine mixed with myrrh. And amidst the screams of agony as they were nailed to the crosses, and we are not told that Jesus remained silent and didn't actually scream out in pain, they would have heard Jesus also cry, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
they would have noticed a complete absence of anger from Jesus. He never answered back or cursed those who were insulting him. In that sense, he was completely silent. What kind of man forgives his tormentors? We are seeing all too graphically, aren't we, the atrocities that happen when one country occupies another, particularly when a huge country occupies a smaller country. Had these thieves thieves, seen their wives raped by Roman soldiers? Had they seen their countrymen, even their children, cut down in the streets? Had they had their homes torched or their land and crops requisitioned by the occupying forces of Rome? And this so-called Messiah prays forgive them. They would have seen the soldiers throwing dice for Jesus' clothes. Being Jewish men, they would have known their scriptures well from childhood. So maybe the words of passages like Psalm 22 came to mind. A Jewish lament for the innocent which ends with God vindicating the innocent and which includes lines such as, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. And then, I was poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. And again, they have pierced my hands and my feet. That was written a thousand years before the Romans had Roman uh, crucifixion. And then they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Maybe they thought then, was this Jesus, the promised Messiah after all, actually fulfilling a thousand-year-old prophecy? They would have seen how Jesus showed compassion to others, to his mother, and to his close friend John in asking them to care for each other when he had gone. They would have experienced the world go dark in the middle of the day. We will never know what the defining moment was that changed our thief's heart. But that doesn't matter, as it is probably true for many of us who come to know Jesus as our saviour as well. It's often a gradual dawning, an understanding of who Jesus is, step by step. For some of us, it may have been a sudden encounter through a dream, a vision, or a powerful explanation of God's word, or maybe a miraculous intervention by God in our lives. Whilst for many of us, it may have been a long journey of discovery. But the nature of our journey to find Jesus is less important than the destination we arrive at. A personal relationship with the living Jesus. Once I didn't know him, but now I do. To paraphrase the words of a blind man that Jesus healed. Or to reiterate John Newton's words. I once was lost but now am found, was blind, but now I see. So, we know that the man's change of heart was due in some way to his close-up encounter with Jesus. But his prayer will show us that the impact this personal encounter had on him. The first thing that we see is that it led him to fear God. Don't you fear God, he said to his compatriot. Unlike his compatriot, he feared God deeply. Why? He'd been cursing Jesus just a few minutes before. Perhaps he realized that he was guilty 
before a holy and perfect God. In fact, we know he acknowledged his sin, perhaps for the very first time. He says, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. Now, as a Jewish man, he probably clearly believed in God all his life. But he had buried that belief under a life of robbery and vengeance in the face of Roman aggression. He had hardened his heart. But his encounter with Jesus changed all that. He knew his punishment was justly deserved and that he didn't stand much of a chance when, very shortly, he would have to give an account of his life to a God whose teachings he had largely ignored. He was afraid. To get to heaven, which we've been thinking about this morning, involves accepting that we are sinful, that we can never, ever be good enough for God to allow us into heaven. God is not going to give us our spiritual oyster card on the basis of how good we've been, because the eligibility for travel is perfection. Looking around me this morning and looking at my reflection in the windows, I do not see reflection. Perfect. I don't see perfection, so none of us can travel with that spiritual oyster card on our own. Secondly, he recognized Jesus' innocence. But this man has done no wrong, he said. Not only did he know his guilt, he recognized Jesus' innocence. And it was on this basis that therefore he felt he could ask Jesus for help. He must have known these words from the prophet Isaiah, probably as famous to a Jew at that time as John 3.16 is to us. Surely, wrote Isaiah, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Another prophecy being fulfilled before our thief's very eyes. To get to heaven, this is what we have to accept. That we are sinners, but that Jesus has taken the punishment for our sins on himself. He wasn't dying for his own sin. He was dying for ours. This is the glorious truth of the gospel. It is his perfection that gives us the eligibility to get to heaven. Thirdly, our thief calls Jesus by name. It's clear that at this particular moment, this was not some inherited belief in a vague God. It was a personal belief in the only person who can add the necessary credit to our heavenly oyster card. As Simon Peter once preached to the Jewish leaders, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus, you see, is not on the menu of ways to get to heaven. He is the only way. Fourthly, our thief asked Jesus for help. Remember me. He cried out. He acknowledges he can't get to heaven under his own steam. 
It's the equivalent of saying, Jesus, please forgive me. I can't make it on my own. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, watched his beloved Catherine die in agony over a whole year from breast cancer. He wrote in his diary at the time, God's mercy displayed in Jesus Christ is the only ground on which a man can appear before God. Our thief knew Jesus was his only hope. Our efforts will not get us to heaven. We have to ask Jesus for his help and forgiveness. Only he can top up our oyster card. And lastly, our thief acknowledged Jesus as king. He knew the inscription on Jesus' cross stated that Jesus was a king. And so, if he was a king, he must have a kingdom. And anyone with two brain cells still functioning could have worked out that this was not going to be an earthly kingdom. They were on a one-way route to death. It was something, therefore, beyond death. He was willing to submit himself to Jesus' authority for what would happen beyond death. Likewise, to get to heaven, we too have to submit ourselves to Jesus' authority as our king. He is not just our savior. He's not just our helper. He is not just an add-on to our lives. He is our king, and as such, is sovereign of all we are and do. Catherine Booth, the woman we mentioned earlier who died so painfully from cancer, once said, there comes a crisis, a moment when every human soul which enters the kingdom of God has to make its choice of that kingdom in preference to everything else that it holds and owns, has to make its choice of that kingdom in preference to everything else that it holds and owns. So the thief's prayer shows us what changed. Jesus' response then gives us the outcome of this change. Truly I say to you, said Jesus, Today, you will be with me in paradise. In that short response, remembering it was very difficult for anyone on the cross to breathe, let alone speak, Jesus makes three things absolutely clear. Firstly, the thief would be in paradise. Paradise is a word used in the Bible for heaven. There is no doubt you will be with me in paradise. Secondly, being in paradise or heaven means being with Jesus. It is not some ephemeral or esoteric existence. It's being in relationship with Jesus for eternity. That's what being in heaven is. And thirdly, Jesus made clear that this would happen today. Today you will be with me in paradise. His entry into heaven was guaranteed instantly. Now, when we cry out to Jesus for help and forgiveness and accept him as our king and savior, our oyster card into heaven is given to us instantly. And it is credited with Jesus' own righteousness. He doesn't say to us, well, okay, we'll send you on an alpha course, and then we'll put you in a small group for two years before interviewing you for church membership after you've attended a church membership course, and then we'll put you forward for becoming a deacon, and we will vote on that, and then when you reach the heavenly realms of the oversight team, well, your entry into heaven will be approved. No. All these things may be important for our Christian growth or calling, and they are to be valued. 
but they are nothing to do with getting into heaven. Our place in heaven is assured the instant we turn to Christ. One final sobering thought is that both thieves experienced the same thing, didn't they? They both met Jesus up close, but they made opposite choices. One chose to reject Jesus, one to follow him. You see, even encountering Jesus doesn't make you a Christian or get you to heaven. Responding to Jesus does. So to conclude, have you encountered Jesus up close and personal? Have you learned to fear God by recognizing his holiness and your own sinfulness? Have you actually asked Jesus for help and forgiveness? And have you acknowledged him as the king of your life? If you have, you already have a reservation in heaven for you. And your travel documents are all in order. If you haven't, my plea and prayer is for you to consider which of those two thieves most represents where you are at at the moment and to act on the very simple prayer of the one thief who had a massive change of heart. If you would like to consider this further, I've got two copies of a short novel written from the viewpoint of the thief on the cross. It's entitled, Heaven, How I Got Here. It's hard to put down, actually, once you start reading it, and it's very short. So if you'd like to borrow one of these copies, please see me after the service. I will stand at the back by the, the exit door, and I will give it to you, and you are welcome to take it and keep it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to submit to such cruelty and torture and humiliation in order that we may have the way to heaven opened up for us. Please, whether we know you yet or we know you already, Help us in our lives today and forever onwards to submit ourselves fully to your kingship. In Jesus' name, amen.